delighted that uh, we have two excellent speakers this evening uh, to talk with you. Um, this is being held as a, a webinar, webinar, so I'm going to ask uh, Stuart uh, and Jane to talk for about 10 minutes uh, and then leave plenty of time for questions from the audience. So please, can you, if you have questions, can you type them in the Q&A? Okay, uh, the subject of this meeting tonight is about uh, Britain's 200 year long high inequality, high poverty cycle and what we can do to break out of this cycle. Um, uh, it's based on a book that uh, has recently just been published uh, by Stuart Lansley uh, on this topic. Uh, Stuart Lansley is a visiting fellow at the School for Policy Studies at the University of Bristol. He's written numerous books and articles on inequality, wealth and poverty for academic journals and for newspapers. He's an author or co-author of a number of very important books, uh, The Rich Are the Poorer, uh, several books on Breadline Britain, The Cost of Inequality, and on Basic Incomes for All. And he's held academic posts in a range of uh, different institutions, including the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, City University London, Open University, the Universities of Brunel, and the Universities of uh, Reading. Um, he was a former executive producer of the current affairs department of the BBC and has a regular broadcaster and a newspaper columnist. And uh, he was also one of the, uh, one of the part of his television output has included the award winning and important Breadline Britain uh, series on ITV in 1983 and 1991. And with his uh, co-author, Joanna Mack, he has revolutionised the way poverty is measured, and not just in the UK and Europe, but also around the world. So I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Stuart Lansley. Well, thank you, Dave. <laughs> That's a very generous introduction. I've got to live up to that. So um, uh, anyway, can, can I thank um, everybody who's, who's joined us today? Um, and, you know, for braving yet another Zoom event. Um, I, I, um, I'm going to talk about th this long cycle. I'm going to try and compare what's been happening today uh, with the past. And I, I want to start in, in the mid-1970s. Um, the the, the mid-1970s um, was a period of... Um, it, 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 it was, you know, one of the most equal periods that Britain has had. In fact, it was a period of peak equality. But in the last 40 years, we've moved from a, a very equal society to one of the most unequal societies in the world. Uh, and this surge in inequality has also been accompanied by a, a sort of parallel surge in the level of poverty. So uh, the, the, in fact, the, the level of child poverty has more than doubled uh, since the mid 1970s and now stands close to a third of children living up in the official definition of relative poverty. Um, and, and if anything, it's prob probably rising again at the moment. Uh, so so we, are all, we are living and have been living in a high inequality, high poverty country uh, for, the, for, for the first, um, uh, for the last 40 years. Now, any democracy um, has to justify its inequalities, um, but it's extremely difficult to find a theoretical or evidential argument uh, to defend the levels of in inequality that we have at the moment. Uh, indeed, the, these levels of inequality on, on lots of independent evidence have been destructive. Uh, they've been bad for society. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the problems, social problems we have today, of growing fragility. You know, less community resilience, the way that the risks of um, economic change have been passed from governments and business onto individuals and, and, and the labor force, um, have all made for, you know, a much more in, insecure society. Uh, but, but it's also been, you know, inequality has also been very bad for the economy. There is now a range of high level evidence 
you know, not just from individual academics, but from the IMF and the OECD, uh, to show that uh, the, the, the levels of inequality of the last few years, both global and national, have been a significant contributory factor to um, the, the, the instability of the last few years. Now, um, the, the, there's nothing new about this high inequality, high poverty phase. If you look at the, the last two, I've only looked for the last 200 years, but you could extend it backwards. Uh, we've essentially had in, in, in Britain a, a long cycle of inequality and poverty. And for sort of about, you know, uh, the great majority of that time, uh, that cycle has had very high inequality, high poverty waves. The only time when we've actually broken that wave uh, is in the post-war era, when um, when we had um, the, 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 essentially that you know the social reforms of the time, together with the introduction of a softer model of capitalism, uh, brought what some commentators have called egalitarian optimism for, for that particular period. Now, th now that optimism didn't last. You know, the the the, 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 the low inequality, low poverty phase. Um, it, it, it lasted little more than a generation. And the, the, there are several reasons why um, it didn't last very long. I mean, I, th I think the first one is, and it's quite an important one, is that, that the egalitarian community essentially lost, lost the political high ground. They lost the, the battle of ideas. Uh, and um, they lost them to essentially a, a, a relatively small group of new right thinkers, pro-market thinkers, who argued that egalitarianism had gone too far and what Britain needed if it was going to become a more dynamic society was a stiff dose of inequality. I mean, if we, if we look at one, one of those um, who was arguing that was um, Sir Keith Joseph, uh, who became a cabinet minister under Mrs. Thatcher. And this is what he said in, in 1976. Um, the pursuit of income inequality, inequ the pursuit of income equality, will turn Britain into a totalitarian slum. So I mean, he he was pretty blunt about what he thought, and and one of the converts to that argument that that, in, that, that equality had gone too far was, was Mrs. Thatcher herself. So what happened in 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 the next decade was essentially that we launched an experiment in unequal capitalism. And uh, that experiment um, was um, that there were several things at the heart of that experiment. Um, the first one was that much greater freedom uh, was given to business and business leaders. Um, and there was there was a, a big cutting away of regulations, particularly over finance, but also over other parts of business. And um, that uh, leading bi business leaders were given a license, political license, to try and get rich, um, because it was argued uh, that, that that much higher earnings and much higher wealth accumulation at the top would create a much more buoyant entrepreneurial economy. So that was the argument. Uh, uh, it, it, we've now got, you know, from this experiment, we've got four, four decades of evidence. And the evidence shows, yes, we've had the inequality bit. What we haven't had is the, the, gay, the economic gains bit. Indeed, if you, you know, if you studies of the economic performance over the last 40 years show it's been much worse with the exception of one indicator inflation, uh, compared with the post-war egalitarian uh, model of uh, capitalism. Now, essentially what's evolved in the last, um, in, the, in this period, has been a model of extractive capitalism. What I mean by that is that uh, the power, uh, the, 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 this small financial and corporate elite has used their power to essentially um, it, it, it secure a much higher share of the cake than they had before, using mechanisms that have had negative, in, uh, negative effects on the rest of society. You know, these effects you know, include lower wages, poorer working conditions in certain sectors of industry, um, the, 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 and um, problem, you know, 
many of these problems that they've created have had to be bailed out by taxpayers and the effect has also been you know a, a much more pressure on the small suppliers who've, who've ended up with much uh, worse deals and we can take examples i mean there, there are so many examples of how this process of of up, the upward transfer of both existing corporate wealth and uh, also the creation of new wealth has actually been passed upwards um monopolization of, of particular industries overcharging uh, that, 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 that many many of these are hidden. The, the takeover boom, um, which has always ended up with a good deal of transfer of wealth, and so many other examples of of this upward transfer. So what we've effectively done is created an inequality bias in our society, a bias towards inequality. Uh, I've called this leveling up at the top. To coin to coin a current phrase, leveling up at the top by leveling down at the bottom. Well, I think that all this evidence really, and you know, there's a huge amount of academic, academic evidence to support um, this theory. Uh, it, it really says that this, you know, trying to break this inequality poverty cycle is an economic imperative. Now there's nothing very easy about achieving that. Um, as William Beveridge said in, in, in his uh, 1942 report that initiated the welfare state, um, it, it can't be done by patching. What we need is, is a 1945 moment, uh, a transformative moment, or a 17, you know, 1979 moment that kind of reversed the previous one. We need that kind of transformational politics to try and um, break the cycle. Now, I just want to give two things that I think uh, need need to happen. I'm sure you've got all got your own ideas about how how we could achieve um, a fairer and more equal society. But the two I want to mention are first of all, I think that you know somehow or another we need to rebuild the case for egalitarianism. It's pretty well got off, gone off the agenda. Not many people write about it, and to do that, I think we need a top down approach and a bottom-up approach. And the top-down approach means that we need a campaign to, to convince thinkers, leading politicians, uh, policymakers, and so on, that we, we've got it wrong at the moment um, and nothing short of egalitarian process is needed. But we also need a bottom-up pressure. Uh, what we need is a social movement, really, for, for equality. Uh, if we look at some of the social movements of the last 30 years, the women's movement, the environmental movement, the anti-racist movement, they have, I mean, slowly and not, you know, by no means perfectly, but they have uh, exercised an enormous influence uh, over change. And we need something else, um, that, 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 a sort of social movement for equality. But the second thing we need is, is a package of reforms um, that... that, that tackle this inbuilt inequality. What we need is, is, is mechanism, instruments that get rid of these inequality bias and introduce um, pro-equality biases and distributionally neutral biases. And I just, I mean, I just, you know, you'll all have your own list of, of um, what you think we need for that, but I've just written down four things. The first is we need... Okay, well, the first thing is we need a fairer tax and benefit system. Um, the present system is, you know, the pre present tax system is regressive. It benefits the rich greater than the poor. Um, and um, it's less redistributive than it was because of that. And I think any reform to the tax and benefit system should also include the introduction of a guaranteed minimum income floor. Uh, the evidence is that even modest um, that the guarantees would, would be highly progressive and greatly raise the incomes of the poorest third. Um, the second thing I think we do is we need to move from redistribution of income to, re to asset redistribution. We need to harness uh, the pers private personal wealth mountain, which is seven times the size of the economy. Uh, we need to harness that wealth in various ways. Uh, essentially by giving every citizen a, a stake in the economy uh, so that so that you know any growth they participate in 
automatically we can talk about the details of that i think the third thing we need is a new set of rules governing business behavior and extraction to prevent the worst cases of extraction and finally i think we need to change the goals of economic policy so they're much more geared away from luxury consumption towards uh, well-being um, uh, now none of this is going to be easy but uh, we we do have two optimistic and hopeful signs at the moment the first is the government's leveling up agenda now you know it hasn't shown very much at the moment but what it, it has done is cause it cause a debate so we should be exploiting that debate but the second thing of course is covid has created uh, a demand for a, a much better post-COVID society. So um, I think the opportunities are there um, and it's not all totally depressing. Um, we just need to grab those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. That was uh, for that excellent and, and brief summary of a fantastic book. Um, as I said uh, in my introduction, uh, some people have joined since then. If you want to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A and there's going to be plenty of time for questions uh, after our next speaker, who I'd now like to introduce, Professor Jane Miller, recently retired after over 30 years working at the University of Bath, where she served in a range of posts, including Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research, Pro Vice-Chancellor for Strategic Development, Development, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and of course the Head of Department of Social and Policy Sciences. She has undertaken world-leading research on social policy, particularly on family policy, and particularly with reference to gender and changing family patterns. Uh, there are a whole list of honours and uh, posts that uh, Professor Miller has held. Uh, she is a trustee of the Child Poverty Action Group, an elected fellow of the British Academy and of the Academy of Social Sciences. And she's acted as a special advisor to parliamentary committees in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. If you have 10 minutes. Thanks very much, Dave, and thank you, Stuart. Um, thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight and join in this discussion. I think Stuart's written a really important book. Um, it's a book that links together the analysis of poverty with the analysis of wealth and inequality, not just in the financial sense, but also in how poverty and wealth are perceived, how their causes are understood, and how this feeds through into policy. As he puts it in the title of the introduction, knighthoods for the rich, penalties for the poor. Stuart quotes Leonard Cohen, which is always a good thing. The poor stay rich, the poor, stay poor, the rich get rich. That's how it goes, everybody knows. I always think of the 1930s music hall song that my father used to quote. It's the rich what gets the pleasure, it's the poor what gets the blame. Um, this book interweaves this analysis of rich and poor in politics and policy going back to 1800. He shows over time how these narratives have played out and what challenges this creates for the future. And we've just heard some of that and that really excellent. Um, I don't know how Stuart managed to summarize it so well so quickly, but in that really excellent introduction. So there's a lot in there and I'm not going to try and cover it all, but I just a few points that really struck me as I, as I was reading the book and I've had that good chance to read it already. First, as I say, it's an important reminder that we should look at poverty and wealth as two sides of the same coin. Too often in social policy analysis, we focus more on poverty. We look at the circumstances of people living on low incomes. We look at whether and how the welfare state provides support and under what conditions. We don't focus enough on the rich and what they extract, to use Stuart's term, from the system. We spend too much time in benefits, not enough time on tax. We spend too much time thinking about individual welfare, not enough time thinking about corporate welfare um, and welfare for the rich. That's not to say that excellent work on this. Names like Adrian Sinfield and John Hills and others spring to mind, um, and Stuart covered their work in his book, but all too often I think that side of it is underplayed. And I have to be a bit mere culpa here because my research is focused on poverty. It's focused on um, people living on social security benefits and low-income families. I've been involved in a number of research studies over the years, including a, um, a study of lone parents with, in which we um, followed them for about 15 years, and I'm currently working on a study looking at universal credit and the families receiving that. Um, 
One issue or theme that comes from this research, not just my research, but many others, is I think the importance of security. The lack of security adds greatly to the challenge of living on low and inadequate incomes. So managing on a low income that stays stable is very different from managing on a low and fluctuating income. Um, and income that changes in ways that are unpredictable and which you can't control, that adds a whole new dimension to what you're trying to achieve. And more and more people face this sort of unpredictability as the labour market has become more fragmented as we've got more part-time work, more self-employment, more gig economy, people don't necessarily know from week to week what their income is going to be. Um, and I think that's a real problem. I think the security is a key difference between poverty and wealth or even poverty and adequacy. If you have enough money, you have choices. You can spend now, you can save, you can plan for your future, you can plan for your children's future. You can take risks and know you have something to fall back on. For people in poverty, managing your life day to day can be challenging enough making choices and plans for the future over the longer term very hard to do. So I think we need to do more um, to give people income security so that they can make decisions, make changes, make plans, make more control. Poor people need the safety net that rich and better off people can take for granted and they need it for themselves and they need it for their children. Secondly, one of the points that really struck me in the book was a section on peak equality. Stuart's talked about this a little bit uh, today, and sadly, it's quite a short section in the book. Um, peak of equality was in the mid to late 1970s, with the peak in wealth equalisation in the early 1980s. And to quote what Stuart says in the book, the record of that time, she as it may have been, was to prove distinctly superior to the decades that follows. For all its turbulence, the 1970s was as good as it was going to get in terms of scale, poverty and inequality. A really interesting observation, I thought. The 1970s are often portrayed and looked back on as a sort of dis dismal and difficult decade, full of privations and full of division. Um, Polly Toynbee wrote about this recently, actually, in The Observer. This sort of narrative of the 1970s actually suits that pro-inequality and pro-wealth discourse. Um, paints it all in a black light, as it were, encouraging to focus on the um, bad times and forget the good times. And said we should celebrate that period of peak equality and recognise what we were able to achieve through politics and policy. Um, for my final point, just one point left, I want to turn to the afterword. Um, and Stuart touched on this as well in his talk. Um, he quotes in the book the American historian Walter Scheidnell, who argues that periods of equalisation have depended on the four horsemen, as he called it, warfare, revolution, state collapse and pandemics. Well, here we are with a global pandemic to, sp to push us and to spare us. Um, but will it? Uh, will it actually actually do that? I mean, it was clear the gaps in our system were very clear. Sickness, sorry, my light's moving. Sickness benefits were too low and excluded too many people. There was no cover for short-term breaks in employment. The benefits that people would have to live on were too low. The government did introduce measures, important measures, the most significant being the low scheme and the £20 per week uplift to universal credit. But these are already gone or are going. Um, and the leveling up agenda, yes, it's, it's there, the words are there, but it lacks substance and content still. So what do we need to do and how can we do it? Um, I'm tempted just to leave those as open questions for discussion, but that would be a bit coming out. So I need to say something. So just three final points. First, I think the challenge is local, national and global. Post 1945, we built a national welfare state, but I'm not sure national can now tackle the global challenges that we face. Environmental challenges, migration movement, international capital, international organisations. Um, we need to think at different levels in terms of thinking of the solution. Um, and it isn't just a national welfare state that will answer the situation. Secondly, I think we're probably in for a bit of a slow burn. There were six years of the World War II <laughs> before that post-World War changes, and, and actually there'd been a decade of mass poverty and unemployment preceding that. We may need some more time to actually learn, digest, act upon, and really understand the lessons from this pandemic and what needs to change in our economic environment. But thirdly, we can't just write off and condemn. That doesn't mean we, we can't, you know, we can't just stop there. Um, I want to see where I would put my priorities and Stuart said we'll all have our own. I'm going to put mine in relation to future generations and children. I think that's where we need to put our focus. We need to get rid of some of the worst policies that we've got at the moment, like the two-child limit and the benefit cap. 
We need to raise child benefits significantly. Um, Scotland's doing it, um, coming up shortly, or uh, introducing the, a much higher child payment. We need universal high quality free childcare for young children. We need after school and extended care for older children, uh, extended school for older children. We need to reinvent the Sure Start Children's Centres. We need to reinstate the pledge to end child poverty, and we need to make it stick in the context of a more egalitarian strategy for the future. So next generation, I think, is where our policy um, focus should be. I'm going to stop there. I think I've had my 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for those two excellent talks and for keeping uh, so so close to time. Uh, okay, we've already got a number of questions uh, posted in the Q&A and if you want to uh, ask further questions, please continue to post them. I'll put them uh, to the speakers. So Titus Alexander has written, thank you for an illuminating talk and good policy ideas, but we had lots of academic study of poverty and inequality. Isn't it time to teach practical political skills to enable citizens to learn how to become more effective campaigners, just as businesses teach you, teaches uh, practical enterprise. So do we need uh, to stop studying poverty and inequality and, or do it in conjunction with the uh, uh, practical political skill teaching? Who wants to go first? Shall I go first? Or? Sure. I mean, um, okay, well, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Titus. Um, and I, I, you know, I think, you know, academics and researchers aren't going to change the world. They, they never, you know, they have contributed, some have. Um, it's public pressure uh, and public demand that will, will force change. Politicians don't make changes until, um, until they're under huge pressure to, to do so. Um, uh, but I think that it's, and I think we do need this ground up, um, bottom up, you know, pressure from ord ordinary people. And that's not easy, you know, um, because, you know, people have lives to lead, you know, they've got struggles, etc. cetera. Um, and it, it take, it's time consuming. But yes, unless we can get some kind of social movement going, um, it's going to be quite difficult to to achieve these things. We must take some of the, some of these ideas for change are quite radical, and they won't work unless, for example, a basic income. You know, we, it wouldn't work unless we took a majority of people uh, with us. So, yes, I mean, it's not really my expertise to know how how you train people, but I, I think any. I mean, I think I think it's interesting that we do have quite a lot of pro equality. Um, pressure groups in Britain. You know, there's a child poverty group, there's quality trust. There's quite a lot. Um, but, you know, and it's like anti-poverty pressure groups. You, we don't really combine. You know, we work independently and, and, and I'm sure that if there was more joint campaigns and so on, that, you know, we could, we could achieve, you know, more punch uh, than working individually. So, I think there's some lessons here for the sort of activist groups as well. Jane, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's a great idea. It's, uh, and I think it is really important. Um, our political education, if you like, is really important. How we engage at different levels of politics and, and what people are able to do and feel confident in doing. I think one of the things that we've seen in research into poverty, sorry, I'm doing that again, not looking at the other side. Um, in recent years, there's been much more focus on what's sometimes called experts by experience, people who with exper experiential everyday life experience. Um, and I think those voices are extremely important um, to be included in the debate. So having people who can talk about their experiences and draw conclusions on the basis of that is really important part of the politics. So I'd like to see that included as well. I also think it's a, an excellent uh, question. Uh, uh, we live in a democracy which discourages political participation. If everybody tried to participate on every issue, the system would, would rapidly collapse. And so often the message is given that there's no point in doing anything because it's hopeless. But we have good examples of uh, where a handful of people have started campaigns which have transformed the world. So, for example, the Jubilee 2000 campaign which reduced uh, 
massive debt across uh, the, some of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, started as a, an adult education evening class with one retired lecturer and, and eight ordinary students from the public uh, who said, well, why don't we do something about it? And they did. And that snowballed and within a couple of years had 25 million members on that campaign and, and shifted the world. So, uh, and that was in... Uh, the Midlands in England that campaign started so you really can make a difference if people believe they can. Okay our next question is from Ellen. Please could you expand on the point above uh, the move from luxury expenditure to well-being? What do you mean by well-being in this sense? Is that me? Is what I think, I think or... that's you. you yes. uh, okay well um... I think that the, the, what we, I mean, I, I talked about extraction going on, but the, 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 these huge concentrations of wealth and income at the top, not just in the UK, but globally, have essentially distorted the pattern of demand. So, you know, demand is shifted to luxury goods, you know, and so, um, and, we, you know, there are so many examples. I mean, this, this isn't just a matter of, you know, loads of money spent on private submarines and you know yacht, expensive yachts and all the rest of it but but things like in britain you know that if we look at the house building over the last sort of 20 years nearly all of it i mean a huge proportion of house building has gone to build luxury apartments and houses if you go along the thames you know this row after row after row of huge private blocks um are extremely expensive and most of them are empty because many of these have been bought up by the global rich so this is what i mean that, that, that the, what's happening is that the things that will improve well-being are not happening so we're spending all this huge amount of money on on massive luxuries but many of our basic needs are not being met and by basic means you know i mean basic housing ba basic um diet um, opportunities for education, you know, improving uh, the opportunities for people to go, go, go to university. I think there are many things that society as a whole would rather have. Uh, these are the things that contribute to well-being, a, a decent, secure home, you know, a decent environment, somewhere to play where you don't have to spend money. All these things have got squeezed out by, by one the concentration on markets and two these massive concentration of incomes at the top i mean also luxury capitalism there's nothing new about this idea that the, the you know the, the economists in the 19th century um were writing about this they, they you know that the, 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 um thorsten veblen and, and john hobson uh, uh, and many others were, were saying we're creating a society that will self-destruct because you know we're not creating enough demand to keep industry going, and that's precisely what happened. That's what helped create the, the crisis of the 1930s, and it's certainly what happened in 2008. So, yes, let's let's rethink what economics is for, what business is for, what we're trying to create. And let you know, uh, but that does mean a lot. You know, that's another issue that needs a public debate. And the slight problem is that. These debates are slightly confined to, you know, small groups, small think tanks and academics. Jane, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I can only agree, really. I don't think I, I, the only thing I, I suppose I would add that um, who spends what and where does make a difference. And, you know, if we put more money into families with children, they spend it on their children. I'm harping on back to my... Um, uh, mm that I think are the most and they spend it locally so you know it does make a difference to ensure that people have adequate incomes and they will help their local economies if that if, if that money is there. Yeah no, I, I, I agree with the, the comments that have been made as well I mean uh, looking at the long view from 200 years I guess the advance of capitalism is the rich no longer have to have some tree laws to stop the poor dressing in the, so that they might pass as the rich but the downside of course is the, the luxury consumption is destroying the planet uh, through climate change and uh, if we continue with uh, financialization you all mean so that 
if wages don't go up, they give credit so you can buy goods and services that are being produced. Um, the more and more is consumed in a throwaway culture, then climate change is inevitable. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Anna Bira has asked a question for Stuart. Do you regard the, a change of government as a prerequisite for any serious levelling up to happen? Well, um, we're waiting for the white paper on, on levelling up. But I mean, at the moment, the, the levelling up thing is a, a damn squid. You know, everybody accepts that. And if anything, it's redistributing sources to, to richer areas, not poorer areas. So, um, so you know, we'll, we'll give the government, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see, see what they come up with. And, 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 but I mean, I mean, I think we we need a proper plan that raises incomes, and you know things like you know the, the, the redistribution of the tax burden, so they were, you know the poor kept more of their incomes would actually boost deprived areas. So the problem with many deprived areas, they just simply don't have the demand. Wages are low. There's high levels of unemployment, uh, and so on, and there's not enough demand to 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 to, to create a vibrant economy. But the any measures that benefit low-income families and redistribute uh, will raise the standards of living in deprived areas. So we need to think much more, you know, much more in macro terms. Um, but as whether, whether we need um, a change in government, um, I mean, I think we need to ask ourselves there whether, you know, the Lab Labour Party is really wedded to egalitarianism and and therefore the kind of measures that, that that would help to correct things and I think you know that's a little bit of an open question at the moment. Try to be diplomatic. Yeah, I think you know academics we don't like we like to sit on the fence on these sort of political questions in relation to change of government, but but I have to say. There isn't much in the record of the government that we have at the moment that gives me hope that they would pursue a more egalitarian agenda. That's not to say conservative governments can't do that and haven't in the past, but the particular format or nature of the government we have at the moment does seem to me not to have much interest in these sorts of debates and discussions. Um, and levelling up, I mean, it's been defined in regional terms um, rather than in terms of, you know, families and circumstances and situations. Um, I, I, I just struggle to see that that's going to be, you know, come anywhere close to what is needed, really. I mean, Stuart talked about transformational change, and I just can't see in the agenda of the discussion at the moment that, that those radical ideas are there. I agree with that. That's like kind of the depressive assessment. I think without what Stuart described as a kind of social movement, um, none of the political parties are going to move far down the, uh, the more equality agenda. Um, so uh, both Labour and Conservative have to a, a greater or lesser degree followed the kind of neoliberal agenda since Margaret Thatcher was elected and poverty has remained high and uh, we're in a situation where now one per the richest one percent of humanity, according to Credit Suisse, owns more than half of all the wealth of humanity. And if the trends before the pandemic continued, Parliament estimated that they'd own two thirds of the wealth of humanity by 2030. And the pandemic is likely to have accelerated those trends. So unless something radical happens after the pandemic, then it looks like inequality is set to grow. Okay, so the next question. Edward McPherson has asked, how much of the economic community fragility exposed during the pandemic was due to austerity? How far, if at all, did New Labour reverse the trend towards greater inequality? I start on this one for a change? Yes. <laughs> um, austerity, I think austerity has 
it, it, it has made a massive difference. Uh, the policies that came in since the, um, under the austerity agenda have just really cut a swathe through many of the social protections um, at national and at local government um, level. So we've seen so much lost in that time. And some of the spending now is just taking us back to where we were before all that cutting started. So I think austerity did highlight um, or did we were exposed when the pandemic hit because of the austerity policies that had been in place for that decade before that really meant that we were not in the position um, to be, you know, that's why we had to start inventing these things like furlough and stuff like that. We just didn't have the mechanisms and leave tools in place that we should have had if we'd had a functioning um, system. And it's there in social care, um, in the way in which we treat staff in the health service, it, in all sorts of ways, I think austerity and um, spending on schools, um, all those things have been, made a real difference to our capacity to um, respond. And the fact that we responded in such a resilient way, in a way, is, is testament to <laughs> what we can do and what we can achieve. As to the Labour government's record, um, I mean, Stuart say more about this because he talks about in the book, you know, they, they had a very ambivalent attitude because in a way they said, well, we don't care about inequality. You know, we don't mind if some people are rich as well as as long as there's a sort of minimum standard. And, and so there was a sort of view that uh, they didn't have to tackle inequality. I think the pledge to end child poverty was important, though, and it did make a difference. All the evidence suggests, so there's a pledge, we're going to end child poverty by whatever the date was, I forget now, when, when was it supposed to end, Dave? 2020, I think. Um, we're going to end child poverty, we're going to halve it by whatever, we're going to quarter it. Targets, they were there, they were, they were um, fed down to local government who all had anti-poverty strategies and so on, and it did make a difference. The data show that child poverty did fall during those years. So it was a good example of it can be done. It can be done, measures can be introduced, you've got to be forcefully behind it, um, and you've got to push it at all sorts of levels, but I think that it can be done. And there are some things that I said at the end we could do quite straightforwardly now that would make a big difference to child poverty rates and make a big difference, therefore, to the life chances for the future. So, so we can do it. It did happen and we can do it again. Um, well, I just add a couple of a couple of thoughts. That I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with Jane that the you know, austerity uh, was a very significant factor in in the kind of problems that, that we created over that decade. And you know what we have now is is a is is a greatly weakened social infrastructure. You know we have let you know too little money going into social care. We have children's services. I mean you know they've been they've been decimated basically. Uh, I mean and which is which is building up problems for the future. You know the number of youth workers that have lost their jobs and and, and so on. So uh, and you know very little social housing built. Um, but I think there have been other factors that have dri been driving this as well. I mean, there's been a series of sort of economic and social shocks over the last 40 years, you know, deindustrialization and then the 2008 crash. Um, and, and, uh, and um, you know, now we've got Brexit and, and COVID. So all these things, I think when you have an, a society that's got this inequality bias and you have because of that, it's always the lowest income groups or nearly always the lowest income groups that pays the biggest price for economic shocks. And that's essentially what's happened over the last uh, 40 years it, it, it is that it, it weakens resilience. So it, we've got one, we've got an inequality bias and two, the governments have not taken the measures necessary to make sure everybody takes a fair and proportionate share of the costs of change. They've all been loaded effectively onto low income families. So I think, you know, and, and Labour, yes, I think well, Labour had a mixed record. They certainly, you know, they certainly set out to target poverty and succeeded in reducing poverty. But by, you know, allowing in inequality to go on rising, which it did, I mean, the, the top. 1%, you know, increase their share under, under, under new labour. Uh, you are essentially trying to fight poverty with one hand behind your back um, because the mechanisms that were, were used to increase that rich share uh, were typically being paid for by lower income groups. So 
you know, you needed more poverty, anti-poverty measures to, to, to try and correct the impacts of inequality. So I think Labour, you know, by kind of accepting the, the, the not really trying to reform the economy, uh, made it much more difficult to sustain the anti-poverty strategy. Yes, again, I, I agree with the things that have been said on austerity. Uh, before the pandemic started, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights visited Bristol and other parts of, of Britain. And he reported that austerity measures, despite economic growth, uh, were still being implemented in a cruel way which would undermine the fabric of UK society. Uh, that was before the pandemic. The analyses by the International Monetary Fund chief economist and his team of what's happened uh, over the 21st century with previous epidemics and pandemics, H1N1, Zika, SARS, in the 64 most affected countries was that during those epidemics and pandemics, inequality grew slightly, but then continued to grow at an accelerated rate over the subsequent five years. So we already start from a very unequal base. And unless something dramatic changes, uh, after the pandemic is over, inequality is likely to accelerate in, in the UK uh, and to a point where it, it may be that the society, society will begin to crumble uh, if the UN Special Rapporteur is right. So that's quite a uh, devastating um, judgment on the UK from an independent observer. And uh, hopefully uh, there will be a reverse in, in what policies are being pursued. Um, let's go to the uh, next questions. So um, Anna has asked another question, uh, universal basic income, it seems unrealistic to expect the majority of people across Britain to support it. Having the main opposition parties endorse it would be enough to start the debate, question mark. Do you want me to do that or Jane, do you want to? Yeah, I think that's for you Stuart. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I mean, the interesting thing about the, the basic income debate is that two or three years ago, it was treated as, you know, pretty well as a joke. Um, and it's it, it's actually risen up the political agenda in, 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 in the last few years. So you could argue that there is actually a sort of fledgling social movement in, fa in favour of basic income. And the effect of that has been that a number of parties, not just the Greens, but the Lib Dems now, and, and uh, as well as the SDP, and, uh, and the Welsh Labour Party are supporting, are in favour of a basic, a basic income. Um, so it has been rising up the political agenda. Um, I think we need to, the thing about basic the U, the UBI is that there are different models. You know, the idea of having a generous basic income for everybody, um, which is guaranteed whether they work or not, um, is highly controversial. And I don't think any government could ever introduce that at one go or even particularly quickly. So it seems to me that what you should do is start, this is an example when, you know, it's better to think small <laughs> rather, than, rather than think big. That, you know, just start with a modest income floor you know, and we're, we've done some work where, you know, we, we think £40 for a child is actually doubling child benefit effectively, and £60 for an adult would guarantee an income of £10,400 a year for a family of four. Now, that's not enough to live in, live on, but it, it gives them a base, it gives them more choice, you know, they, if they want to try a bit more training or, you know, want to, you know, to, to, to try something, it, it, it gives people choice and a bit of security. And that is perfectly financially feasible. Um, but again, you know, until we can campaign um, and get, you know, the majority of the public behind it. But it isn't going, the, the Tories aren't going to introduce anything like this. And Labour at the moment, you know, is probably not going to either. Um, so if we are going to get it, I think it's a little bit like one of the, if we look at some of the main progressive policies as the last, 40 years the health the free health the, the, the child benefit the national minimum wage it took decades 
before they came. I mean, people were campaigning for the national health. I mean, the Labour, Labour Party first recommended a minimum wage in in 1910. You know, so it took uh, over uh, over a century. You know, um, or uh, nearly a century. So, I think a basic in some kind of basic income will will come simply because the world is too insecure, um, and this is one way of tackling it. But it, it it's not going to happen in the next five years, but it might happen in the next fifteen. And I think as soon as one country goes. You know, as soon as a major country goes, and there, there are a lot of pilots going on around the world, and you know, attempts to have pilots in in the UK as well. So, this isn't a debate that that's going to fold. I think. There's a comment uh, that the Welsh government is trialling it now. Do you want to say something about that? Yes, the, the, the um, there's been a big debate within the, the Welsh government. Um, about this um and they are going to have i don't know the details because it's only been the decisions have been taken in the, in the last few last week um but yes they are going to have some kind of pilot i mean one of the problems is that the scottish government has also been wanting to, to to hold a pilot but they're being prevented essentially by the west westminster government because in order to launch a basic income pilot you need to have some freedom over taxes and local benefits. Um, and that's not being granted. So I'm not quite sure how, the, how Wales are, are, are going to get around that. Or, um, uh, but this, this has been one of the, one of the, one of the problems. Um, uh, I, one comment that's sometimes made is that basic income has quite a lot of support in the ultra rich uh, tech entrepreneurs in California who arguably see it as a way of uh, just uh, allowing themselves to carry on uh, getting richer and richer and not paying tax while uh, maintaining the, the social structure uh, with a, the minimum cost. What would you say to that argument about basic income? Well, I think they, 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 I welcome their support for basic income, uh, but the reason they want a basic income are, are self um, self interested. Um, that doesn't nullify, you know, the policy. I mean, they want. I mean, um, you know, and I think also that there is some altruism going on in America as well, because you know, there's this, uh, there's the billionaire campaign for higher taxes on billionaires, isn't it? You know some quite big names in, in in involved of that, and I think that is genuine. I don't, I don't. I mean, it, it, history suggests that the rich only make concessions when you know the, their own livelihoods are at stake, um, and you know this may be one of those occasions when they recognise that you know we're going to have to make some concessions, um, just as they made a few concessions after the war, um, but only temporarily. So, um, you know, the more people, I mean, if the, more, the fact that they're debating is a good thing. Okay, there's some more questions. The Green Party is quite vocal about transforming the economy to a socially focused economy rather than wealth generating. But while they continue to have one MP, what are the chances of this being taken seriously? Not so sure. Question. It's a comment, really, isn't it, on <laughs> on the challenges of, of our current political system? I think, and what minority parties can and can't do, and and the you know our first po past the post system doesn't enable these sorts of minority positions to um, to come more centrally. But some other countries in Europe, we can see green parties making much greater advances and being much more involved in government. So, so maybe it's partly in our political system, the, the, the barriers lie. I, I just briefly, I mean, I mean, I think if we're going to solve the climate crisis, the West has to cut consumption. Um, you know, we have to drive fewer cars, change our kitchens less often, you know, fly less and all the rest of it. So while allowing, you know, um, developing countries to, to, to catch up and most of that, if we're going to cut consumption, the, the, you know, it's the rich, the top 1%, you know, the cause, 
30 times more pollution than the, the you know the bottom third so the rich, the rich are going to have to take if we're going to solve the, the climate change crisis the rich are going to have to take a very big hit um so and the greens of course have made a huge contribution to this debate because you know they they've been arguing it for years and, and the other political parties have have been catching up because they've been forced to because it's obviously become a sort of a major issue um you said but the big question is you know how transformative will all these policies and, and and this new interest really be are we really going to see you know the banning of suv cars on motorways or whatever you know whatever the i mean people i mean the the the, the you know greater london council is trying to introduce much harsher rules governing traffic flows and so on and you know taxi drivers and and are slightly up in arms about it. And, and you know the ordinary i mean workers who, who've got old cars so you know these things that are often bitterly fought um but if we want to protect i mean as jane was saying earlier on we should really be thinking about the next generation which has you know had a fantastically bad deal in the last decade um and they're going to get a bad, you know, they're going to get, they're going to get the, the bad end of the environmental crisis unless the rest of us do something. Okay, we've got time for a final question from Titus Alexander. Inequality has grown alongside the dramatic increase in higher education. Are universities part of the problem? As gatekeepers to better paid jobs, systematically excluding people and maintaining privilege. One of the biggest political divides is now between people with and without degrees. And I think this one's for Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting <laughs> one. <laughs> and raises a whole lot of, we've only got one minute left, so <laughs> not time to debate this fully. Actually, I think I would answer by saying that we really do need to look at what's our priorities for education spending? What, where should we be spending in relation to education? We've very, um, we've always been very um, mean and stingy on further education. So if you don't go to university, there's not much other options for you after school. We've always been pretty stingy on preschool and ensuring the quality of education there. So I think a, a look at the whole um, distribution of the way in which we spend and support education would be um, a good way forward and, and, and would, would have, um, you know, would be beneficial for more people, um, have wider distributional effects. So I've kind of ducked it there by suggesting we need to look at the whole system. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I think I, I, I also need to uh, hold up my hand, my hand about this uh, question because uh, recent IFS analyses has shown that University of Bristol has one of the lowest rates of uh, uh, pupils who uh, are receiving free school meals. And I think mm -hmm. universities around the country need to do more about widening participation and maybe go back to some of the uh, uh, outreach uh, work they used to do in the past. Um, I, we've come really to the end of our session and I'd like to thank everyone for uh, such brilliant questions from the audience and also to thank our two marvellous speakers for such an interesting debate. Uh, the time has flown by. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, thank you for coming to this uh, University of Bristol uh, public event uh, which has been sponsored by the uh, ESRC and also in conjunction with the Bristol Poverty Institute. Uh, so please, uh, if you can, uh, thank uh, thank our speakers. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very thanks in the chat. Yeah. Bye, everybody.